I wrote a little bit my answers. Okay. Me with English, but uh, I will add it. I will improvise also. Okay. So who you have, who you see here on your screen, of course, is is Rajesh Tanda, your good friend Rajesh. Hello, um, Rajesh. And, uh, and uh, Niharika, Niharika Call, who is a uh, brilliant uh, lawyer, who's also a researcher working with Rajesh. And then the fellow uh, nearby with the black shirt, that's Bud. Yes, hello, Bud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send you, do you, you, do you remember when uh, Rajesh and, uh, and I and you, we went to lunch in uh, Cartagena. Yes. And we, ma we made an MOU. Yes, on the on the, paper. On the uh, yeah, I, yeah. I have that. I still have that. And really? I'm, go I'm going to make a copy and I'm going to send it to you. And I'm going to ask you to, to <laughs> send it to your, the, your rector at the university and, uh, and say that, you know, no matter what happens, uh, there's now an MOU and here's the proof. <laughs> yes, and uh, and did did you did you look at it to see if we have uh, done what we wanted to do together? Pop? We are, we are, we're we're actually making. I think we're ahead, ahead of the plan. Yes, yeah. <laughs> wow, wonderful. And we are fact, more more successful than we thought we could be. <laughs> oh, wow, wonderful! And uh, in fact. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm working, you know, I, I don't talk about it, but I'm working a lot with my African teams. And I think I have one that could become a hub in oh. Niamey, in Niger. Oh, yes. wonderful. 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 Because it's the, it's the dean of a research institute in human sciences. So he has, a, he has some power and uh, he has a wonderful uh, colleague, such a brilliant researcher on climate change and Anisu. Uh, my young friend who is doing his PhD in, in Germany, but is working closely with them. So I think we may have uh, the, the embryo of a hub there, but they have no money. So for them, can, it would be totally impossible we, to, to follow the training or anything. And I don't think they speak English. So we, have, we will have to find a way uh, to, well, we will have a find a way. We will have to be, Imaginative. Yes. We, we, we can do it. We can do it. We, yes. We're very imaginative. We're yeah. So let's uh, begin. We're recording this, uh, Florence. And so let me just, uh, for the sake of the recording, we'll edit it and send you a copy. Um, we're, we have a, we're a great, great pleasure today to be able to have an interview with uh, Professor uh, Florence Piron, who is a professor of communications and one of the world authorities on uh, cognitive justice, knowledge democracy, epistemic justice. She is uh, located at Laval University uh, in, the, uh, in Quebec and uh, has been responsible recently for the creation of a knowledge for change hub uh, in the Quebec area, which is a partnership between <clears throat> Laval and a community organization working on health for uh, refugee women. So um, we have prepared a number of questions and uh, we will alternate asking the questions and uh, Rajesh Tandon will uh, ask the first question. Thank you, Florence. Wonderful to see you. It has been a pleasure working Thank with Rajesh. you over these years. And uh, my first question really is that, you know, you have been taking your stretch of conversation and contribution on epistemic justice, on knowledge democracy, as Bud was saying, open science, and its related infrastructure. Now, how did you, how did you put this science and knowledge and justice together? How did it come about? And when did it come about? Okay. So, uh... It will be a, a bit of personal history, but personal history is fundamental to, to understand where, how we think and why we are doing research. So since the beginning of my studies, in fact, even if I had not that vocabulary of epistemic justice and 
or, or, or that at the time. Uh, I think that's the, the I've always always been in, interested in in epistemic justice. I was in Paris studying philosophy in a very elitist institution, as only France <laughs> knows how, how to to create that. And I was struck. I was very young. I was struck by the the despise the the arrogance of one of our philosophy professors for us, for the students, for our questions, for our knowledges, uh, as well as by the insignificance of some of the classical problems of philosophy we had to learn when the world around me had so many mysteries, questions, and, and so on. So I, I felt really in my skin the divide between uh, what we do in, in, in university, what we did in university, in classroom, and the world around. Uh, and I think, well, firstly, this is when I decided to go towards anthropology, uh, which has become my main discipline for the master's and the PhD doctorate, uh, because I wanted to discover new ways of seeing and inhabiting the world mm. uh, than this uh, elitist uh, way of, of, of being. So for me, knowledge has always been in the plural form. Then during my master's studies in Canada, I discovered how the indigenous peoples of Canada had been colonized, bodies, territories, and minds, and also how they have been narrated much more then, had, then they have been given the possibility of narrating themselves within science, within history, anthropology. My, my research was about the scientific explanations given to the over delinquency of indigenous peoples in Canada, a theme that is alas, still on the agenda. And I then discovered the power of social science to construct reality through its discourses uh -huh. and to influence social policy but also I discovered what we call now systemic racism within the justice system. So it was for me an eye opener. Then in my doctoral research, I decided to use the life story method. And I'm still a, a huge advocate of the life story method in social science because I was, and I still am convinced that this is the best method to collect the multiple knowledges of a person without denaturing, misrepresenting of, or distorting these knowledges. Mm. But I discovered that it is much more complicated than, than that during my, my fieldwork, that the life story is in fact a co-construction, a dialogue between two human beings and that power relations can still influence it. And this discovery has been also an eye opener, including uh, for my work on participatory action research, for instance, today. I will come to, to that later. Um, well, like, while I was doing my PhD, uh, well, it was with adolescents, uh, young, young people in Quebec, um, uh, the life stories, I had the opportunity to work for, for a research group about women in Sahel. Sahel is a, a part of Francophone mm. Africa, Burkina Faso, Niger, Mali, Senegal. And it was an incredible opportunity because I was very free to do what I wanted. So with a colleague from Burkina, she was also a doctoral student uh, like me, we decided to work on women's knowledges in order to show that these knowledges exist and are precious even if these women, especially rural women, were oppressed, exhausted, etc. We thought, and I wrote a paper uh, that made uh, me an enemy of radical feminists for a long time, that, on, that if we only denounce the hardness of Sahelian women's lives, as these feminists did, it would prevent the international development actors to trust them with money and responsibilities. How can we, uh, how can we say in, in the meantime that these poor women are so oppressed that they don't have time to think? and also ask that we give them responsibilities and, and money. So we, we wanted in our work to showcase the knowledges of these women to reverse this power situation. So in 1992, uh, we published a, a, a text called uh, Women's Knowledges in Sahel, How to 
value showcase local knowledge. Uh, and it was the first solid commitment to my efforts to value the plurality of knowledges and to, to tell science that there are other knowledges so well adapted to the context, to the practices of local actors that are very precious. We even were able to do a very interesting case study uh, in Burkina showing how local nurses trained in Western medicine did not trust the capacity of illiterate women to just observe physical phenomena and find innovative solution to our problems. So uh, j j let me just tell you this anecdote because it's, it's very, it was a very strong eye opener for me and it still remains as a, an example story. The, the woman, the illiterate woman in a cooperative had been taught how to cook um, some cereals to, to better feed babies, to, to fight um, uh, malnutrition, uh, mm, mm, uh, hunger. Yeah. And uh, so they came back to their village and, and do the recipe, uh, but they discovered that the baby had a, a belly ache. They, they were not happy with the recipe. So they decided to cook the, the recipe five minutes more. And then it was much better for the babies. And they, they came back to the nurses to tell them we improved the recipe. And the nurses told them, no, you didn't. Uh, you, you burnt the vitamins, so it's not good. Uh, you, you, sh you are not able to, to do that. So for me, it was really a, a way, it was between women, between African women, not even not, you know, white people. And so I, I understand and understood at that time the, the fight between knowledges, mm. experiential knowledges, uh, scientific knowledges and, uh, and so on. Um, so afterwards I, I decided, I, I worked in, in, in Quebec and on other themes, uh, management and so on. But I made a promise to my friend that one day when I have the means to do it, I would be back in Africa and do, you know, real empowering research. I, I knew that I couldn't do that just with my good will, you know. And this is what happened in 2014 with the SOHA project. The, so the SOHA project was an re action research project about open science in Haiti and Africa. Mm -hmm. Why Haiti? Because in the meantime, in, in 2010, I had been in Haiti to teach after the huge earthquake that was so terrible over there. Uh -huh. I taught there many times and I discovered a lot of things. Notably have the students, even doctoral students, even professors were not trained adequately to use their computer for their studies. They used it as a typewriter. They were, they didn't know all the, the, the richness of the scientific web. I also discovered a, a wealth of local uh, thinkers, authors, anthropologists, decolonial thinkers that we've never heard of in, in our universities in the North. And I also discovered how in Haiti, authors from the North were always given precedence over their own local authors. Mm -hmm. So therefore one could say that I, I discovered the colonization of the minds on the field. I, I saw it on the field before even reading, you know, uh, about it in, in celebrity famous texts and so on. And I also discovered the material injustices that accompanied this this kinds of uh, epistemic in, mm, injustice, mm. including the lack of digital literacy of research infra infrastructures, mm. etc. Et so when I read in, in 2011, I think, I read the text of Shiv Visvanathan, the famous Indian anthropologist, the, the text called The Quest for Cognitive Justice. I was ready not only to adopt the concept of cognitive justice as an ideal, but also to to, I wanted from the start to transform it so as to include another kind of justice that the epistemic justice, mm. much more material justice, Ma material, I mean, the means to work and to think. And this is when my commitment to open access came into play. In fact, following my, my understanding of the power of knowledge, I read a lot of Foucault at the time, <laughs> I started not only to theorize, you know, scientific citizenship, 
to write and, and, and read about citizen science action research and so on. But I wanted also to take action. So I created an association called Association Science et Bien Commun, Science and Common Good uh, in civil society. And also the same year, I was very productive that year, 10 years ago, I created a science shop within my university. So this is two, these are two tools of knowledge democracy uh, that, that uh, I found uh, indispensable. Uh, with our association, we wrote letters to journals denouncing the commodification of science and universities. We organized conferences. We wrote political briefs. And in 2015, we started our editorial branch, uh, the a publishing house that now publish books in open access. Um, and with the science shop uh, in the university, I tried to introduce, to introduce, sorry, service and experiential learning within the teaching mission of our university. Uh, our science shop was not oriented towards research as are the majority of science shops in Europe, for instance. Uh, we really wanted to, to help community organizations and to answer their needs. And their mm. needs were not about research at the beginning. It was really little things. And so we, we, we how can I say, we, we, you, we, we discussed with them their needs and then we found uh, professors or lecturers who, who accepted to include uh, the, the answering these needs within the class. So it's mainly uh, undergraduate uh, class uh, and it, it, answering the, 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 the demands of this organization became one part of the evaluation of the class. So this is our great innovation. And so it, it was free, completely free for the organizations between, because nobody was paid the students were doing the project within their uh, learning uh, time, within a class. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, well, in, in almost seven years, we did uh, uh, more than 200 projects uh, for 1,700 uh, students. Wow. Uh, so, so really, we, we really have. And now, thanks to uh, the Knowledge for Change uh, network, and thanks to you, we want to, to add uh, more research to, to what we offer the organization, more uh, participatory action research. So this is where we are with our, with our science shop. So when the time came to imagine the SOHA project in, in Africa and Haiti, I decided not only to do research and give a voice to students and academics from French-speaking African Haiti on their working, studying conditions, on their dreams and difficulties, but also to train them more in open science, mm, mm. especially open access, how to navigate the scientific web and so on, but also uh, participatory action research and science shop. We, 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 uh, I presented the concept of science shop as a tool for local development in, in Africa. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, well, a, a group of professors, of graduate students uh, were convinced and, and we tried to work together to create uh, so science shops in Africa. We have now 10, but in very different levels of, of, a develop, of a development. So the SOHA project was deeply an action research project aiming at fighting injustices that prevented uh, academics from Africa and Haiti to, to develop their talents, their intelligence, their knowledges uh, in service to their countries. Um, but also uh, we, 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 we wanted to create things, to create uh, tools uh, to help them, material tools. For me, for me I, I cannot conceive the fight against uh, epistemic injustices without taking into account these material dimensions of web, of computers, of electricity, of the, the, the realities, the local concrete realities that our, our friends in, in Africa and Haiti are facing uh, every day. So this is 
the way. <laughs> I, fascinating, I fascinating journey. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known the details of your journey for a wow, wow. But you know the, the importance of your life story, as you were saying, you know, uh, the yes. life story as a method. We are actually reconstructing your life story as uh, three of us are listening to it. And we are thinking of our life stories as we resonate with you. You know, we have all gone through similar trajectories in order to arrive where we have arrived. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for that wonderful well, you know, story. It's, it's a matter of meeting people, seeing opportunities and making links, you know, uh, making links between things that could be se seem separated at first and then everything is woven together yeah, and, yeah. and we advance. Wonderful. But you, you have yeah. another floor. Yes, and Florence, you, you have in uh, some of your recent communications, you've proposed uh, a, a, an approach to the question of scientific communication from a different angle. You talk about um, a dialogue of knowledges what, what do you mean by a dialogue of knowledges? Yes. Um, well, uh, since I have always been interested in, in uh, uh, breaking the wall, you know, between university and society, uh, I, I've tried a lot of uh, way to, ways to, um, uh, how do you say in, in English, to... to uh, <laughs> mobilize knowledge to, to disseminate knowledge outside of university. Uh, so I tried a lot of things. Even, you know, I wrote some video games for youngsters. I, I tried a lot of things. But um, I have always had a problem with the, the, the fact that, that all these activities were unilateral. I don't know if it, you understand it's okay in English, this word, it's always from university towards society. Mm. And it's one way, oh, yes, one way, one way. So I, I now, I, I really insist when, when I talk about scientific communication to, to say that it should not be a one way communication. In fact, communication cannot be one way. Uh, so scientific communication, science communication should not be only the communication of research results. Research results is the passion of researchers because it is the, 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 the raison d'être, the, the, the why they work, you know, to publish their results and that determine their, the career and prestige of researchers. But this is scientific information, you know, each paper, each article informs unilaterally its readers of what the researcher has discovered but it's always in a completely controlled manner. It is the authors, the researchers who choose which information to include or exclude, even if they have to obey precise normative codes, of course. This is not communication. For me, communication sh should be two ways. So one way communication for me, it's information from the researchers to either other researchers, or if they publish in open access and so on, to the general public. So for me, how can we imagine concept, another conception of science communication, which can be much more two-way, so much more dialogical? So this is what I've been trying you know, to, to imagine. And this is what I call, well, dialogue of knowledges. Um, I want to stop here a little bit on the term knowledge, which I always use in the plural form even if it's not grammatically correct, either in French or in English. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I have noticed that it is very difficult for academics to, to, to remember when, for instance, they talk about what I do, to remember to use the plural. Mm. Uh, for instance, our science shop is called Accès Savoir. Savoir means knowledges, and it's in the plural form. Well, the name is Access Knowledges, if you want. But, Every time, even my friends, my deep, my small, most solid supporters, they stop at the plural form <laughs> and re 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 rewind to the singular form. Mm -hmm. Because why? Because scientists have been taught that they are the holders of the knowledge. 
the knowledge in the singular form, meaning the only valid knowledge, scientific knowledge, the good and true knowledge, as opposed to many other kinds of knowledge, you know, secular knowledge, common sense, opinions, uh, experiential knowledge, or all, kind of, all kinds of knowledge that are not the knowledge. So for me, I've always used, since our text in 1992, always used knowledge in the, in the plural form. And for me, it's not a, it's not a detail at all. And, and so the, 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 this way of, of considering the, the knowledge that is used in universities as the only one, well, I don't have time here to, to, to narrate my fight against what I call positivism. Uh, it's the, the scientist positivist uh, uh, way of doing uh, sciences. It's so, well, let me say just, it, it's so simplistic because scientists themselves have a lots of different knowledges, even if these knowledges are meant to remain invisible and not being talked about. For instance, a researcher does not only have the specialist knowledge on which his or her expertise is based, which is recognized by his peers or, and colleagues. In particular, he or she has methodological knowledge that enables uh, them to predict what type of action will lead in what, to what consequences in which context. They also have contextual knowledge that allow them to assess whether a research subject is socially relevant, could bring more money, could help them in personal struggles. They have also interpersonal skills that enable them to work more as well in a team. Uh, they also have technical knowledge that enable them to write or obtain uh, funding. And, and they of course have knowledge in, all, in fields other than uh, their official expertise related to their personal, personal interests and commitments. And all of these knowledges are involved when we write a paper, if, an, if they do not appear in it. So mm. it's just an mm. example to show that for me, each person in society has a multitude of knowledges, technical knowledge, of course, but also interpersonal knowledge, political knowledge, experiential knowledge. And all these knowledges constitute an immense, immense wealth, which science, alas, wants to do without. And of course, there are knowledges that come from other epistemologies, a word that I still use in the plural. That is to say, other ways of thinking of constructing knowledge. So the scientific communication that I propose consists in promoting the dialogue of all these knowledges, but making uh, made visible mm. in the name of mm. the common good of the necessity of, of action. And one example, of course, is participatory action research, mm. Uh, mm. because what is frequently called co-construction of knowledge must uh, first uh, allow a dialogue uh, and, and some and people uh, being uh, able to listen to and to understand the knowledges of the other. This is the, the basis, this, the dialogue uh, to, to be able then to co-construct knowledge within a research, participatory action research uh, process. Uh, so for me, this conception of science communication seems much richer and more interesting then you know the communication of research results. <laughs> but this, this way of thinking uh, requires a fundamental change in the attitude and training of researchers, because now they are, the, the training only tries to persuade them they possess a unique and privileged knowledge compared to the rest of the world. You know, this, this uh, dialogue uh, of knowledges that you mentioned, as part of science communication, I began to, I began to understand this a little more when we were working together on this uh, policy brief on open science in uh, last year. You know, and yes. and you know, you brought such such enormously important perspectives uh, when you were constructing that brief. You know, open to what science is open to what. Uh, how 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 do you how do you how do you construct this open you know the meaning of open science because science open science has historically been very narrowly 
you know, open access, open data, that's about it. But you 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 broke open the open. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, uh, in fact, it's it's really um, um, it came once again. It it came from what I did. Mm. You know, I, I I love philosophy. I love abstract uh, thinking. I was good at it, but really, uh, when I I when I chose to do anthropology, it was because I knew that I had to learn on the field with people. I had to, to before, you know, uh, being able to theorize or give synthesis like the one we, we did in our brief. So um, uh, I, I tried, in fact, I tried different kinds of openness. As I told you, I tried a lot of uh, activities to open uh, universities to the society uh, in a dialogical way. Uh, so video games, but also events, uh, uh, all kinds of, <laughs> of events, public consultations. Uh, I, I tried and I worked also, you know, I had a seminar for a long time on participatory democracy. So I, I worked a lot on what was the meaning of uh, participatory democracy and openness uh, of public debate to, to citizens. So it, it was my, my, my job in my department of communication. It was what I, I brought there. And, and we tried a lot of experiments uh, with citizens on, on especially on health uh, issues and how, how to create the conditions of a, a real debate in which they could make their voice heard and so on. So uh, it, it is a bit of a detour, but it helped me a lot not to be naive, uh, especially regarding citizen science and uh, uh, what, what could be uh, a citizen, uh, scientific citizenship. Um, not naive, but also not cynical. And uh, I, I read, for instance, I was fascinated by the, the Nobel Prize to Yu Yu, you know, from China, uh, who turned to medical uh, Ch Chinese traditional medical texts uh, to find a traditional cure for malaria. And, and it helped her extract a, a medicine, uh, artemisinin, uh, that saved millions of life. So for me, it was obvious that this dialogue of knowledge could happen and, and help uh, humanity. Now uh, I'm trying to, to finish a paper in which I want to use the concept of relationality, which, which comes from, well, both, well, let's say, comes from uh, Aboriginal epistemologies, uh, the, the, the idea that relations are first, comes for, come first, um, uh, before the, the entities, in, instead of seeing the world as entities and trying to understand their relations, the concept of relationality uh, teaches us to, to see the relations first. So I mm. try to really use this concept in, in an, anal an analysis that I, I'm doing. This concept is also found in, in the Jewish tradition, which I, I know uh, I've studied in my dissertation uh, with Levinas, for instance, or Edgar Morin, the complex, complex thinking. So this is very, very fascinating. So uh, I, I, I lived, I've been living this uh, uh, dialogue on knowledge and, and forced myself to open my minds to other uh, yeah. ways of thinking, to other, uh, when you do life stories, you know, with people very different from you, you have to open their minds. So when we discussed together about this brief, you know, uh, I think it was the right time for me when I, I tried to, to explain to you all these kind of experiments that I've been through about openness of me, my mind, my university, my classroom. And uh, so I, I found that to, to define three uh, ways of uh, opening science, I mean, if it's classical, it could be easily reminded <laughs> by uh, readers, you know, so openness to publication and data. 
this is the, the, the most uh, uh, frequent uh, meaning of uh, op open science. And for me, it's still very important, even if I have a lot of things to say about that, maybe we could talk about it later. Um, uh, I think this openness is fundamental to ensure continuing training for you know, all the professionals in our society for, well, for me, it's fundamental to, to, to give access to, to raw science, to papers, to, to social actors, and not only, mm. you know, translations mm. by mediators. But then it was openness to society. And openness to society, I put within this category, uh, different things that maybe are not the same level, the same universe, uh, are not on the same, uh, uh, yes. Well, people from within this category sometimes do not know about the work of others. But for me, it was different ways of opening university. And I say university, not only science, because for me, science is done within universities in a material way. Mm. So, you know, it's always my, my insistence on this. So to open university uh, to, to, to society. So this is participatory research action, of course, but also all the projects uh, that could be uh, gathered under the umbrella of citizen science. Mm. Citizen science, it's not at all like participatory action research. In citizen science projects, especially use, use the ones that use digital tools, um, the, the, the citizens are invited to participate to research projects that have already been conceived and, and designed and, and funded by researchers. They are invited to contribute as uh, uh, collaborators or uh, data uh, collectors. So it could be an environment, in astronomy, in mathematics, all kind of things. It's, it's fascinating uh, field, but it's not empowering for citizens as participatory action research projects uh, can be. Uh, I also uh, added in this category all the movements of um, uh, fab labs and uh, citizen labs so these are material uh, uh, projects where all kinds of people, whether or not academics, can gather to create, uh, well, software, objects, uh, prototypes, uh, innovations, uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, so uh, for me, all these projects are ways in their own universe to open university to non-academics. And so uh, it's very important. Of course, collaborations with industry uh, are also in this category. It's not an, only, a, you know, a, 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 a citizen-oriented uh, uh, category. Openness can mean collaboration between uh, university and industry. And we have to have a critical uh, stance on, on that, of course. And then the third category was openness to excluded knowledges. So I came back to, to my first and foremost fight, you know, against uh, uh, epistemic injustices. Um, and exclude, excluded means excluding from science because these knowledges can be very alive and very used and very useful in their communities. But for science, they are invisible, they are non-interesting, they are even bad, you know? Uh, and so within this category, I also wanted to, to, re, to regroup, to, to gather different kinds of excluded knowledges. Because the, the, in, in the world of um, uh, decolonial thinking and the decolonization of the minds, uh, paradigm. Uh, it's mainly, you know, uh, the, the traditional knowledges that are denounced as being uh, excluded. Uh, the local knowledges of the peasants, of 
of indigenous peoples and so on. But with my field work in, in Africa and in Haiti, uh, in their universities, I also uh, consider that the, the knowledge that are produced by Global South researchers are, is, are is, I don't know, <laughs> excluded from science. There is a form of systemic racism within the science, Eurocentric science uh, dominated by you know, publishers from the global north. Uh, so for me, this, this is also a, a category of, uh, of excluded knowledges. So this is why in our brief, uh, I wanted to, uh, I proposed you to, to have both, you know, the, the exclusion of indigenous knowledges, but also the exclusion of knowledges from the global south researchers, and even within African universities, there are so many mechanisms of exclusions between, you know, elders and, and young researchers and so on. So for me, this is also part of excluded knowledges. So this is why, I, this is what I wanted to, to bring to, to, to our brief. The, uh, the brief, uh, I think, is having quite a lot of impact. Uh, with uh, with the with UNESCO um, as they uh, struggle to to create a recommendation on open science and we're already seeing uh, you know some uh, adoption of the language that uh, that you authored uh, Florence and you're in the open uh, science brief I, I want to turn back to uh, you mentioned earlier uh, that when you began your work, and I think, you know, within the, uh, the SOHA project, you had an opportunity. Um, you talk about um, uh, paying attention to the, to the architecture of knowledge democracy. In other words, to, to uh, opening up a digital, uh, if we could call it digital empowerment um, and uh, the construction of, of uh, different kinds of, of technical platforms. And uh, this is something that, uh, you know, I think I, is quite interesting. Could you tell us a bit more about your, uh, the work that you've done in terms of supporting, you know, these kinds of digital uh, platforms, um, you know, and how that fits into your approach to, uh, you know, to uh, knowledge democracy? Yes, with pleasure. <laughs> um, well, uh, one of the things that I discovered uh, during the, the, the years 2010 uh, was, you know, the open source world. So um, I, I discovered the, the, the multiple ways that digital uh, tools can be uh, not only in the service to the big uh, GAFAM players, you know, Google and so on, but also how open source tools can, can uh, help and, and feed all open science initiatives. So uh, and I decided, you know, I wanted to learn uh, how to do it myself, not to be dependent on, on technicians. So I learned how to, to create a website um, with a WordPress technology, which is an open source uh, software technology, and uh, I, I tried to, to really, to really uh, understand uh, how it works. And I discovered the Creative Commons uh, licenses and all, all, all this world. It, it is something. And um, uh, when I discovered the, the lack of digital liter literacy in, in Haiti and and Francophone Africa, um, I wrote a guide. Uh, during the night, it was very interesting. It was during a conference in Haiti, and the students. When I said that there were millions of of open access papers on the web, uh, the students were looking at me with such eyes. It was like I, I said to them something both incomprehensible and so full of hope. Uh, giving them so much hope. So during the night, I wrote the first draft of, a, of our guide. Now it's a famous guide to how to do research, uh, documentary research 
uh, on the f uh, free uh, scientific web. Uh, and well, this is one of the, the documents that I'm the most uh, proud. So I, I, I taught, I, I went in different, lot of African university to teach that guide and, and so on. But I was thinking in the, the meantime that if I do that, what, I, what I'm doing is reinforcing the hegemony of the Western science, because only the Western science was in open access. Because of the lack of tools of digital literacy in, in, in African, Francophone Africa, because it's different from the Anglophone Africa situation. In Francophone Africa, they, have, they had almost nothing in open access. The, the main research in Francophone Africa are in dissertations, and the dissertations were not online, and the research reports, not online, and local journals edited by faculties, always printed. For them, the, the, for some professors, you know, uh, the, the web cannot be compatible with science. The web is Facebook, is uh, fun, having fun, videos and so on. And they do, did not understand that it could be also a way to, to reach papers and so on. So I, I understood that, yes, I could teach uh, students how to find things, but also I had, and it was urgent to help African research to be online and in open access. Because if not, I was, you know, undoing my, my, my fight. And so I, I explained that and everyone understood very quickly uh, in Africa and Haiti, the, the, the urgency of doing something. So we did a, a, a huge project with a Pan-African organization to help them create an institutional repository to put in open access all the dissertations and, and research reports. Well, it has been a very complicated project and, but it's still, it's still there. The repository still exists and I hope that they will make something good out of it. And also I, I said to myself and, and my friends, my African friends, we have to also create journals, African, Pan-African journals, uh, using open source uh, technology because it, it's not expensive at all. And we have to invent a new business model, a, a way of working together uh, to, to create these journals. So we call the, the, the platform, the Knowledge Granary, Grenier des Savoirs, because we wanted it to be like a granary where all kinds of knowledges are available, freely available to uh, students, academics, social actors who need knowledges about Africa, about their context in open access in French, in their language. Uh, well, French because it's their common language, but even in their own, in their own language. So when we were convinced of that, I discovered a, a technology called Pressbooks that allows, that allows uh, to create books uh, in open access uh, as websites, but also to generate PDFs that can be printed as printed books, which is very important in, in Africa still uh, for prestige, for career, for promotion, you have to print. Uh, which is very different from the global north, where we, you, you don't have to print anymore. So having this technology, uh, well, we created first our publishing house. I, I told you about it we, within our association. Uh, so we publish books, open access books, that also can be printed and, and be sold. And so we decided that this publishing house should be, well, should be, you know, or should represent all our values. So open access, but also we use gender inclusive writing, which is a very e important issue in French. Uh, and we want to promote uh, uh, all kinds of languages. So plurilingualism. So we ask all authors uh, that are not French speaking, born French speaking to translate their bio, their abstract, their introduction into their own language. And we publish 
half and half books from the north, global north and from Africa and Haiti. So we have a bilingual books, for instance, uh, uh, Creole, Haitian Creole and French, or more recently, we have published a bilingual book, uh, Fulani and French. And then we, we decided to transform the software to be able to, to adapt itself to, to journals. So I worked with a little uh, company in, in Montreal, uh, not-for-profit uh, computer uh, company. And so they, they did a remarkable work on the software to really adapt it to, to journals. Uh, and with all my friends, well, we managed to create 15 journal, uh, journals. And these journals all have a, an African name and uh, they are pan-African. So they, are, uh, they, they cover different countries and th that theme is not disciplinary. It's really, uh, uh, they are really problematics or paradigms, mm -hmm. African paradigms. And uh, so th this is really uh, wonderful, but it's very difficult also. We have problems because we have to, to train them ourselves and, and the, the review boards in, in the, this <laughs> job and it, it's difficult and we have no money. We only use the surplus of the publishing house to, to fund uh, the, the, the knowledge granary. So it's difficult, but you know, it's a concrete utopia, utopia. And I think everyone is convinced of the importance of doing uh, this, this work, this platform. Of wonderful, trying. wonderful. Great yes. story. We've published five issues now. So it's really encouraging. Wonderful. Now, you know, you, you were one of the few global leaders in knowledge democracy movement today. At the same time, with the pandemic during this past year and what is happening around the world, you know, the growing inequalities and, and uh, you know, restrictions on democratic expression. You know, uh, how do you see the future? How, how, do you, how do you see the future for our movement, for this movement of knowledge democracy going forward? Well, uh, uh, I must say that, well, I'm very optimistic by nature. If, <laughs> if I had not been, I would have, I would have not tried anything. Uh, and and also, I, I always see, you know, I don't know if it's in English, it's the same meaning that in, in French, uh, reaction, re reactionary uh, behaviors, you know, uh, conservative. Mm. Uh, I, I, I see the, the, the strong voices, uh, the strong reactionary voices that we hear today, especially in France. I don't know if you are aware of that debate, but it's very sad and we have the same in, in, in Quebec uh, about uh, uh, incredible critique, even from the governments of, you know, post-colonial studies and so on. I see that as a proof that the, the, the movement is strong and going forward. <laughs> so I'm not impressed, you know, by reactionary uh, discourses. I see that as desperate moves by an older, well, older, more male uh, generation of, of thinkers that are very afraid to lose mm, uh, mm. their territory, their, their tools of domination, and so on. And I see so many uh, young people from uh, uh, everywhere, you know, especially I, I see my, my children, for instance, my, my two daughters are students now. And for them, uh, well, they are my daughters, of course, but I see for them that it, it's obvious that uh, we have to add uh, authors from the global south, for instance, to, to our curriculums in, in, in the north and to, to exchange knowledges and, and travel, and, but in, in both directions. Uh, so, so I see a, a really an, a, a new generation that is powerful and convinced. Where I am less optimistic and sometimes really discouraged is, is about the 
the decolonization of the minds. Because even if in, in some of my most decolonial students, you know, I have to work on them and, and uh, deconstruct their representation of what prestige is, what knowledge should be. For instance, one of my students who is a wonderful uh, researcher, thinker, but also, you know, entrepreneur and so on, he still, I, I, I surprised him once uh, saying that, oh, if I can go to Harvard, it will be the summum of my life or something like that. I said, what? <laughs> what is Harvard? This is the symbol of the domination of American uh, science. And so I had to, to you know, to, to so in, in st I still receive so many messages from students wanting to go study abroad in Canada. Whereas I've met, I'm working, for instance, for the Knowledge Granary, my, my, the, 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 my closest collaborator, the, the one who is piloting, uh, the pilot of everything, he has never left Cameroon. He has done his PhD in Cameroon. He has never even traveled to the North, the global North. And he's so brilliant and intelligent and able, and uh, uh, he has been able to develop his digital literacy in an incredible way. So this is what keeps me a bit desperate is because it's so comfortable, you know? To, yeah, yeah, to, yeah. To say, oh, I will go to the North and I will be good. And also for the money, uh, for the granary, I, I said to all the, the review boards, the, the, the editors, try to find some money in Africa. Don't wait for me to find money for you in the global North. This would mm. not be sustainable and you would still be dependent but for them, it's so inconceivable that they can, they could find money in in their countries, in the African Union. They always have the reflex, you know, to think, oh, the money will come from the north, from the corporation, the Sweden corporation, and so on. So this is, I think, really difficult to find this tendency to to the, the reflex of of dependence and uh, say, well, no, we, we, we're going to manage by ourselves and, and find money in our country to be independent. So this is for me uh, a bigger threat, you know, to ecologies of knowledge, yeah. of knowledge than the, the, the old reactionary white male uh, scholars from the North that will disappear <laughs> one day, so. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Florence. Fascinating. Uh, our students are going to love uh, uh, hearing, you know, hearing this recording. Um, and you've been able to, uh, you know, uh, I know I know quite a lot about your work, but I learned a lot more um, today. Um, and uh, let's let's think about other uh, other conversations that we can have uh, in the future. Is there anything else that you uh, for this particular interview that that you would like to add that you think would be important for students and uh, knowledge activists to, to know about? Yes, uh, just a word about publication. Because I think that uh, academics, uh, doctoral students and so on are not well trained in, in that matter. Well, they are very well trained to learn how to publish in prestigious journals and so on but they're not made aware of the power of publication and of where and how we publish and to whom we, we, we write to when we write a text. You know, it's, it's still the same positivist uh, paradigm that which I, I fight. Mm. So uh, where we, 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 when we write a paper or a text, we, we address ourselves, we, how do you say? We, we address ourselves to, you know, science, to our peers, and that's all. No, we can do much more than that. For, we can write to our peers. Mm -hmm. I've done that, mm -hmm. you know, I've done the classical papers in classical journals and so on. But we can also write to specific publics. We can also write in, in different ways. So writing, writing is an art and is an art of communication. 
uh, and and we 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 have to make everyone aware of the power of choosing where and how to to publish. Yeah. And, and for instance, I wrote a paper once as a dialogue because I wanted to show a debate, and I said no, I, I cannot do really show a debate in a monological form. So the text is a dialogue. It's a fictional dialogue, but it is in a dialogue form. And yeah. it's very efficient, I think, to, to make the readers aware of the debate. So we have the power of the world, but maybe the only power that we have, especially when we, when we are doing social and human sciences, but we can do a lot uh, if we write in such and such way uh, to such and such public. And I think it's, it should be really important, especially to uh, social activists, you know, to, to make them aware of that. When you, you can write a research report because you have to, because the client is asking for a research report. But you, you have to defend your right to also write blogs, to also uh, write poetry, to do a lot of things with, with your knowledge. And uh, I think especially for people who want, want, to, to, want to become academics, this diversity of writing should really be, be uh, taught, explained. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. What a wonderful stories and reflections for us. And we are really grateful for this opportunity, for this Thank conversation. Thank you very much for, for the you, You're looking great and your smile is infectious, my dear. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Keep well and we look forward to continuing our conversations. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.